Revelation 14 this afternoon. Revelation chapter 14 as we look into God's Word together. For those of you who have just come today, <clears throat> haven't been here in the past, and the opportunities that I'm having to speak here at the conference, I'm uh, having us look at some of the occurrences in the book of Revelation where the title, uh, The Lamb or the Lamb of God, occurs. And um, that title, The Lamb, in reference to Christ, occurs some 30 times in the New Testament. 28 of those occur in this book. And it is the uh, prominent title used for the Lord within the book of Revelation. And, of course, that doesn't mean there's 28 different occurrences, so to speak. Of the, I mean, there's 28 different occurrences, but uh, in one passage, the Lamb may be, that title may be used two or three, four times. So it's not that there's 28 separate different passages that you could look at and end up with 28 messages, so to speak. But uh, we've been looking at some of these. And um, in the first message that we had, we noted Christ's authority and ability to deal with sin from Revelation 5, 1 to 7. And then secondly, we noted that Christ is worthy of our praise because of that in Revelation chapter 5, verse 8 and following. Yesterday on Sunday morning, we noted that saints those who have trusted Christ as their Savior will be safe in heaven where the Lamb will care for them. Suffering saints are safe in heaven. And then yesterday afternoon we noted that because of the blood of Christ, the accuser of the brethren really has no sway over us. And when he seeks to accuse us of our sin, we can go to the references in Scripture where the blood of Christ is referred to and note what his blood has done for us and we can banish the accuser from our presence. This afternoon, from Revelation 14, verses 1 through 5, we want to note that God commends and praises those who in their ministry faithfully follow the Lamb without compromise. God commends and praises those who faithfully follow the Lamb in their ministry without compromise. And I want to entitle the message this afternoon, God's Commendation of the Lamb's Followers. God's Commendation of the Lamb's Followers, Revelation 14, 1 to 5. Let's pray this afternoon and commit our time to the Lord, and then we'll read those verses together. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the good fellowship we've had today. Thank you, Lord, for the brethren. And we can come from all parts of the country and gather here and encourage each other, sharpen each other, be a blessing, edify each other, and build each other up in the faith. And Lord, even as we've done this afternoon, to laugh together and just to enjoy um, each other's presence. But we thank you especially now that we can turn our attention to your word and we can enter your presence and place ourselves before you that you might feed us. We pray that the Holy Spirit would be able to have a free course in our lives this afternoon, would be able to minister the word to us. Father, give us understanding hearts and ears, and might we be able to make the right application to our own lives today. Father, bless our time. Honor yourself and your son in it, and we pray these things in your son's name. Amen. God's commendation of the Lamb's followers. If you'll follow, I'm going to begin reading with Revelation 14 and verse 1, and read down to verse number 5. And I, another reference to the Apostle John, and I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Sion, or Zion, and with him an hundred forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder, 
And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the firstfruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. God's commendation of the Lamb's followers. Well, the Bible records that the children of God will receive various rewards when they enter heaven. There's probably one reward more than any other that a true disciple of Christ deserves or desires to receive. And that is the verbal pronouncement by God, well done, thou good and faithful servant. As a commendation by God, that reward is not simply another honor given by God, but folks, it's actually the expression of God's own spirit and thinking about that Christian and their ministry and labor. It is his personal praise because of a, his recognition of a man's faithfulness. It is one thing to receive a tangible reward, but it's another thing to receive the personal approval of God, to be the object of His personal pleasure. Now that raises the question as to what it is about a man's service that causes God to make that pronouncement. What are the characteristics of faithful service that enable God to express that level of approval? Well, the passage before us is one of the places in the Bible that helps answer those questions. Because it is in these verses God is commending a group of men who faithfully follow the Lamb during the latter days of the tribulation. And his commendation is made up of listing the qualities that made these individuals faithful followers of the Lamb. There are other passages in the New Testament that discuss other qualities. But in the tribulation, the Lord lists in verses 4 and 5 several qualities that he commends these followers of the Lamb for. But to lead us to those, let's first of all put these verses in their prophetic context. And for those who have been here every service, this is just going to be a point of review. For those who are here just for today, hopefully it will be helpful. But we can't understand the message of these verses unless we put them in their context. We can't just take and pull those words out and make them say something. We need to put them in the context. And so very briefly, of course, you're aware, now we're in chapter 14, but you're aware that chapter 6 to chapter 18 of Revelation deals with the tribulation and the judgments of God that are poured out during that time. But in chapters 12 to 14, okay, 6 to 18, but in chapters right in the middle, chapters 12 to 14, those judgments are paused for the reader. It's like you've got judgments, and then they stop. You've got three chapters, and then the judgments pick up again. There's a pause that occurs here. It occurs for the reader so that God can expand on certain themes for our instruction. Now, in particular, chapters 12 and 13 record and discuss the powers of evil that are behind the world's opposition to God, particularly the climax of those individuals in global power under the leadership of the Antichrist who is supported by the false prophet. And some of the events in those chapters are historical in nature, occurring before even the birth of the Messiah. 
And some of the events in those chapters are actually future. But those two chapters record for us the evil forces that have been running underneath the surface for all of these thousands and thousands of years, forces opposed to God. That's chapters 12 and 13. But folks, chapter 14 turns the tables because it's in this chapter that we're given a glimpse of the coming victory of the Lamb of God. And the events in this chapter are not happening at this point, actually, but are a glimpse into what will take place in chapters 15 to 18 of this book, particularly the victorious events that will occur as the Lamb takes possession of His kingdom and defeats those evil forces. So this is a chapter indicating the Lamb's triumph over the forces of evil which since the early days of Babylon in the Old Testament have been resisting the authority of God. And all these millennia, they have opposed God and now the Lamb is victorious over them. But here's our message for this afternoon. As the Lamb's victory is sketched for us, so is God's commendation of those who have followed Him during the latter days of the tribulation. Days in which the Antichrist and false prophet rule and will abuse and torment and even execute those who don't follow them. And yet in the midst of that severe persecution, these in verses 1 through 5 remain loyal and faithful. And as God commends them, folks, He sets forth for our example. He sets forth the qualities which He deems precious in those who follow the Lamb in such savage seasons. And the question we'll begin with is this. Will you and I manifest these qualities in the perilous times in which we live? Will we be faithful in these things even when our ministries seem to be in vain? Or will we compromise? Let's begin here. Verse number one gives us the appearance of the Lamb. The appearance of the Lamb. And I looked, and lo, a Lamb stood on the Mount Zion and with him an hundred forty and four thousand having his father's name written in their foreheads. As John looks into the future, he sees two things. Number one, he sees the lamb standing on Mount Zion. Now, that is very significant in light of all of these millennia of years in which evil forces have opposed God. It's very significant. And that significant, I think, is seen, if you'll go back with me for a moment, to Psalm chapter 2, the second psalm. Some of you right away are familiar with that psalm and know exactly where we're going. Psalm 2. Let me begin reading with verse number one, and I'll read the first three verses and then make some comments. The scripture says, why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed saying, let us break there. The theirs referring to God and to His anointed. Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. Now in minute fashion or detail, here is a record of the opposition which the nations under the energy of Satan have had for God from the days of Babel all the way through to the tribulation. They have set themselves in opposition to God. The world's one united passion is to oppose God. And this 
climaxes in Revelation 12 and 13 when the Antichrist sits in the temple claiming to be God and accepting the worship of God. And if we would have the opportunity this morning to open the meeting up, we could take and you could give, all of us probably could give illustrations from our society and culture around us of the evil forces as they, as they seek to oppose God. Many nations, for instance, in the world today, or some anyway, are actually making laws that ban people to follow the Lamb, to submit to Christ and trust Him as their Savior to become a Christian. And other nations are banning the Scriptures, as they have for generations. The nations, they're not aware of this, but they have set themselves against God. And they've been doing that for thousands and thousands of years. And God knows of that. He's not taken by surprise. He knows. Ah, but here's the joy. Look at verse 4 now, verses 4 to 6. He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my king, my king, upon my holy hill of Zion. Now we read of that in Revelation when that's going to happen. God will set or establish his son on Mount Zion as the universal ruler. Folks, these words were said a thousand years before Christ's birth, and now in Revelation they're going to be finally fulfilled. And then you read on in verses 8 through 10, and you go, and you, uh, those verses describe the Lamb's victory, the Messiah's victory over the nations. And the raging nations are countered by the installation of the Messiah on Mount Zion as God's king. Now just think of that. In Revelation 13, we're in Revelation 14, but in Revelation 13, the nations are compelled to accept the mark of the beast. And now in chapter 14, John sees the lamb standing on Mount Zion, and he's actually the victor. He's the victorious lamb. And John sees that. Now, notice secondly back in Revelation chapter 14, something else that John sees. Okay, now remember, this section is talking about God's commendation of the followers of the Lamb. But the followers of the Lamb can't be really commended if the Lamb is not victorious. So the passage doesn't really start with the followers of the Lamb and their qualities and their activity of faithfulness. It begins with the fact that the Lamb is victorious, but these people have followed the Lamb even though during the tribulation it appears he's not going to be victorious. During the tribulation, it doesn't appear like the Lamb is on the throne at all. I mean, you've read enough of Revelation to know that. It really looks like the forces of evil are going to triumph. But these people exercise their faith and they know their Bible enough and they say, you know what, that's not true. And even though Christian people are being slain and slaughtered, even though they can't buy and they're being hunted and hounded and persecuted, and no one seems to respond to the Lamb at all, and you've got this Antichrist and his false prophet, and they say they're God, we don't believe it, we're following the Lamb. And now the scripture points out, look, the Lamb will be victorious. I mean, it's one thing to follow the Lamb, you know, when... And we ought to, but it's one thing to follow the Lamb when, you know, He's the victor. And, he, and, he, and He's, you know, above everyone. But then you've got people, though, who are exercising faith when it appears all is lost. But they know the truth and commit themselves to it. So we're beginning with the Lamb and His victory, working our way to the followers. But the second thing here that John sees, he not only sees the Lamb standing on Mount Zion... But would you note in verse 1, he also sees the followers of the Lamb. They're stated here to be 140 and 4,000 having his Father's name written in their foreheads. 
Here are the 144,000 Jewish converts who come to Christ during the tribulation. They're the same 144,000 that are revealed or recorded back in chapter 7, verses 1 through 8. Chapter 7, verses 1 through 8. Verse 2 says, And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and to the sea, saying. So one angel says to the four angels, who will be given the ability to hurt the earth. That angel says to the four, verse 3, he says to them, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Who are these? And I heard the number of them which were sealed. And there were sealed an hundred and forty and four thousand of the tribes of the children of Israel, of the tribe of Judah, of the tribe of Benj Reuben, of the tribe of Gad. Verse 6, the tribe of Aser, the tribe of Nephtilim, the tribe of Manassas. Verse 7, Simeon, Levi, and Issachar. Verse 8, Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin. Now, over in chapter 14, John sees the Lamb standing on Mount Zion, but he sees these 144,000 Jewish converts there standing with him. And that chapter back there reveals that these 144,000 are the servants of the Lord and evangelize the world for God during the final days of the tribulation. So they're a very special group. And John sees them standing with the Lamb. But would you know what he sees about them? He doesn't describe their garments. He does tell us how many there are by way of identification, but he doesn't describe their garments. He doesn't really at this point describe their activity. Here's what he tells us. He notes that on their forehead they have their father's name written. They have his father's name written. What is significant about that, folks, is if you go back three verses into chapter 13 and begin reading with verse 16, you will note that during the tribulation, the only people who can buy and sell and in essence live outside of starvation are people who have something else written on their forehead. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it's the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score and th six. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him an hundred and forty-four thousand, having, folks, not that name on their forehead, the name that appeared to be victorious in the tribulation, they had another name on their forehead. It was his father's name written there. And they have been loyal to the Lamb during those dark days of deceit and persecution. And it is these individuals that God is going to commend folks for their loyalty. Along with the Lamb, they will be victorious over the powers of evil and God will commend them for their loyalty. So here's what John sees. But that leads then to verses 2 and 3 and the honor of the Lamb's followers the honor of the Lamb's followers. After John sees this, he hears something. He sees and then he hears. What does he hear? Verse 2, And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters and as the voice of a great thunder, and I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung, as it were, a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but or except the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. Folks, what is recorded for us here is a unique honor which the 144,000 are given because of their faithful witness for the Lord during those hostile days. Did you note what that honor is? 
The honor is that there is a song that is given to them. They are taught a song to sing in heaven, and it is a song for them only. Would you note this? Look, verse 2 gives us what I've called the melody. And I heard a voice from heaven, number one, as the voice of many waters. That may be a reference to the volume or maybe the power of the voice and of the song. Secondly, it's the voice of a great thunder. And maybe that's a reference to the intensity and the reverberation of this song through the air. But notice as well that it's not volume, it's not a noise kind of song. You know, a song that people just get up and, you know, they just, they just cut loose. Ah, no, no. It's a voice, and I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. It also sounds like that. There's this power and there's this intensity to it that reverberates throughout the throughout the atmosphere in heaven, but it sounds like a harp. Have you ever heard a harp played? Ah, oh, the beauty of it. I mean, you get someone who can take and just run their fingers over the strings and the beauty of that, and it sounds like that. I've simply labeled all of that the melody, the tune. That's what it sounds like, like a great thunder and like many waters, but not just blasting away, but with this quality like a harp. But would you notice songs also have what? They have a text or they have words. And it says in verse 3, and they sung. They sung. These people lift up their voice and they sing, an indication that there are words to this song. Now, I would like very much today to tell you what those words are but I don't know. And the reason I don't know, and the reason you don't know either, and the reason they're not in our hymnal, is because this is their honor. Nobody else gets to know this song, and no one else gets to sing it. Do you see what it says? Look, verse 2, or verse 3. And they sung, as it were, a new song. It's a new song. It's only for them before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders, and no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand. Nobody else gets to know this song or sing this song. This is a song unique to them. It's their honor that God has given to them because of their faithfulness. That song is exclusively theirs. I don't really know how to give any great explanation of that except to maybe use the words of another individual that they said. They said, maybe the glory of this sinks home when you remember that in Psalms, David and Asaph received divine revelation for songs they wrote and which they played with instruments. There were songs that they got directly from heaven. We have some of those recorded in the scriptures. Maybe that's something of what's taking place here. But at any rate, here is this honor. They are given words and given a tune, and no one knows the words or that tune except them. It is their honor. And folks, God recognizes their faithful service with this unique reward and honor, a song written for them and sung by them. As I was thinking about that, an illustration came to my mind that I was somewhat involved in probably about 10 years ago. There was a particular church that was hosting a conference. It was actually my brother's church. And uh, they were inviting a number of just different individuals to come. And they have a conference like that every three years. And <clears throat> I've never gone, but on this occasion, the pressure was on. And so I went not as a speaker or anything, just to attend and have my own heart stirred and edified. But they have a, several very excellent musicians in their congregation, and one of them, in fact, some of you may have his piano music, a young man by the name, well, he's not young, he's 35, but a young man by the name of Nathan Arnold. And he writes a lot of music that's put out by uh, um, the University of Bob Jones there, and even some by the Wilds he's involved in there. And so they had him compose 
for the last night of the conference a special song for the preachers. And they had them all come, the congregation of maybe six, seven, eight hundred that night, and they had them all come. All these preachers came, and about 125 or 130 on the platform. And then they, they stood there while the congregation just sang this song to them. A unique song composed just for that occasion for those men to encourage them in the ministry, and it was entitled, Be Strong, O Man of God. Now, you can't have 800 people sing that to you and think, you know what? Well, the only thing you think is, you know what? I need to be strong. Maybe that's somewhat what's going on here. A song composed just for this occasion, for these, and they get to sing it. It's an honor that God gives to them. Now, why are they given this honor? Let's come back to the text. Why are they given this honor? Well, notice in verses 4 and 5 now, this is where we're going to spend a little bit of time, the character which God commends. What was it that about their service and life and ministry as servants of God during the tribulation that caused God to give them this honor? And I'm not just, again, this afternoon, folks, you understand, we're not just trying to fill our head with information about the future. The Lord has placed these things here for our own personal learning. And we're to make application to our own lives. What is it about these individuals' ministry and their labors for the Lord that caused God to commend them with such a unique honor? Well, verses 4 and 5 give us that, the character which God commends. And you're going to note, folks, here that what is here is character. It's not activity so much as it is character. These are they, number one, which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. Two, these are they which follow the Lamb, whithersoever he goeth. Three, these were redeemed from among men, being the firstfruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was no found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. The character which God commends. Four qualities are given to us which God holds folks in high esteem. These aren't, this, this isn't some individual pointing out, you know, these are great men. I've learned a lot from their life. I mean, all of these men have, you know, have evidenced this and this and this and this. These aren't men commending men. These, this is God commending these men, and he's pointing out qualities that he holds in high esteem. And because these men were faithful to those things, they got this unique honor in heaven. Number one, the quality of moral purity. Verse 4, the quality of moral purity. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. Two statements are made that define this quality in these individuals. Number one, the scripture says they were not defiled with women. Which, of course, by the way, indicates to us that the 144,000 are men. They have to be men. And they've not defiled, the scripture says, themselves. The word defiled means soiled or stained. Now, because scripture speaks of the blessedness of relations in marriage, the idea here is that these men have kept themselves chaste. They have not defiled themselves with immoral activity in the sexual perversions of the day. And as one of the commentators stated, quote, you can only imagine what those will be like in the tribulation. You know what kind of perversions are around in our day. But folks, there's still the impact of Christians upon society. The Holy Spirit is still there keeping things under control. But imagine in the tribulation when believers are gone and that kind of influence has departed. You can only imagine what the perversions of the day will come and what they'll be like. And we've got people in the Bible who were confronted with these kinds of things, Joseph and other individuals. This assault. But these individuals have kept themselves pure and God commends them. But note this as well. Couple that 
with the fact, folks, the scripture says, for they are virgins. In other words, they have never known intimate relations. And this would indicate that they are celibates and have never been married. Now follow this. So what you have are 144,000 men who are not married and have kept themselves pure and during the tribulation they are witnesses around the world for God. Now, why is that so commendable? Why is that so commendable? Number one, what is it about moral purity that is commendable to God? I mean, why does God commend that? Well, folks, the Bible reveals that there is an earthly relationship which God has designed that is a beautiful picture of the faithfulness of God's people and himself. And that picture is marriage, right? And in both the Old and New Testaments, unfaithfulness to God is said to be spiritual adultery. And so God honors moral purity because it pictures that intimate relationship of integrity and faithfulness which his people have with him. He honors moral purity, folks, because it's a picture of the intimate relationship his people have with him. And when there's an immoral activity, it's not the right picture of God and of his people. But folks, the position of purity and celibacy which these men have taken for God is commendable. How so? Let me show you three passages. Let's tie these three other support passages together and we'll note why this is commendable in these men. Matthew 19, 12. I don't intend to really comment on these. We're just going to read them and they'll really be self-explanatory. What is it about the, not just folks, the moral purity, but the fact that these men have remained chaste and, um, and as celibates during the tribulation? Why is all of this commendable to God? Matthew 19, verse number 12. Verse 11, But he said unto them, All men cannot receive this saying, save they to whom it is given. But, the, but there are some eunuchs which were born from their mother's womb, and there are some eunuchs which were made eunuchs of men, and there be eunuchs which have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. Now note this, he that is able to receive it, let, it, let him receive it. And we'll come back to that. Not everyone can take this approach to life. Okay? But there are some who have made themselves eunuchs for the kingdom of heaven's sake. In other words, they have remained celibates. We're going to go beyond that in our audience, but they've remained celibates for the kingdom of heaven's sake, and there's a commendation here. Notice as well, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 32 and 33. 1 Corinthians 7, verses 32 and 33. You know this passage, but let's tie it in with Revelation 1 Corinthians 7, 32, But I would have you without carefulness. He that is unmarried careth for the things that belong to the Lord, how he may please the Lord. But he that is married careth for the things that are of the world, how he may please his wife. Again, the Lord is not stating that, you know, nobody can get married. We go back to the early days in Genesis and God established marriage and it is an honorable thing. But there are times when God gives the gift of celibacy. And that kind of individual can give themselves totally to the Lord's work. Now remember, we're talking about men in Revelation who have done this. And they're being commended. Why is that so commendable in the tribulation? Look at 1 Corinthians 7, go back to verse 25. Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment of the Lord, yet I give my judgment as one that obtained, obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful. I suppose, therefore, that this is good, good to be single, good for the present distress. 
You know what the tribulation is like? To say it's a present distress is putting it very mildly. Paul says, I think it good for the present distress that a man be single like this. In other words, folks, going back to Revelation, the demands of the times almost require celibacy. If you're going to be a faithful minister for the Lord, and the Lord is, again, during the tribulation, not excluding marriage, so don't go beyond that. You know, that guy's against marriage, you know. <laughs> All right. But folks, think of, think of the tribulation. And you know enough from the book of Acts what happened to some of those men, to Peter and Paul and the apostles. And the abuse and the persecution they faced. And you have read enough biographies to know what it's like behind some of these curtains in some of these countries where the gospel is, is uh, really opposed and the man is put in jail and you know how his family faces the persecution and the harassment. Now multiply that with what you know about the tribulation. And as we've looked in the past messages, I mean people, Christian people folks are slaughtered. It says in 6-9, the same word that's used in chapter 5 for the lamb who was slaughtered. Brother Vesley brought some of that out this morning from Isaiah 52. His visage was so marred you could hardly identify him as a man. Revelation says he was slaughtered. And it uses the very same word for the martyrdom of saints in the tribulation. Will they look like that? I don't know, but the same word is used. And if you're here this morning, you know as a married individual, you're here this afternoon as a married individual, you know, particularly as a man, the heart you have for your family. And if you need some, an illustration of that, read the biography of John Bunyan and how he felt when he had to go to Bedford Jail for 12 years, particularly when his daughter Mary was blind. And the grief that it was to his heart. And you can only multiply that in the tribulation. And folks, the distress of the time almost requires that an individual would be a celibate. Possibly that's what God is really commending here. But the danger and the opposition and hatred almost requires this. And if you need, again, an illustration of that, think of this, folks. There was an apostle like this. And his name was Paul. And for the gospel's sake, he remained that way. And you know what he went through. And you could know, just imagine if the man was married, the grief in his wife's heart when he heard it, when she heard of these things. But he was a single man. So in the tribulation, you have 144,000 who for the sake of the gospel and the Lamb have fully dedicated themselves to the Lamb's ministry. And the Lord commends, folks, moral purity. Now, bringing it back to a more point of application for us today, we won't go there, but in 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 to 7, the scripture says that it is God's will that we abstain from immoral activity. It's not necessarily advocating celibacy. Every person has their gift, and this may not be their gift. So I'm not advocating that today, okay? God gives a man a gift, and if it's not a person's gift, then, then that's not for them. God does give some of that gift, but the point is, folks, that purity pictures Christ in the church, and throughout the New Testament, God does commend moral purity. And without going into a great deal of detail, God's people in the perilous and savage seasons we live in today need to be this way. And there are many things out there that are trying to corrupt us. And we need to be faithful. God commends that in his followers. But would you note with me as well that God commends in verse 4 an undivided loyalty to Christ. Revelation 14 verse 4. He first of all commends moral purity. Secondly, he commends undivided loyalty. 14.4. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they were virgins. These are they, secondly, which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. 
They follow. But folks, the key idea here is not just that they follow, but there's this little bit added on to it, whithersoever he goeth. Now, the idea is not that they follow Christ as he sort of strolls around heaven during the tribulation. I think we would all understand that. It's not that they're commended because as the Lord, if the Lord walks around heaven like that, as the Lord strolls around heaven, they're following him around heaven, and boy, that's commendable, you know? The idea is that they follow his life and his instructions. This is a reference to their earthly loyalty. They are loyal to him no matter what the cost. And again, in the New Testament, Scripture takes that thought, as it does with many concepts in the Christian life, and it presents it to us in different ways to round it out and to give us a better picture of what it means. For instance, what does it mean to follow Christ? To follow his life and instructions. What does that mean? Here's what it means. Mark chapter 8, verses 34 and 35. Here's one of those references where the scripture rounds out that concept. Mark 8, 34. And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever shall lose his life for my sake and the gospels, the same shall save it. So following Christ, whithersoever he goeth, involves that. Matthew chapter 19, verse 21. It also means this. Matthew 19, verse number 21. Jesus said unto him, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that thou hast, and give it to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. It also involves this, Matthew chapter 10, verses 37 and 38. Following the Lamb whithersoever he goeth involves this, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. It means Matthew 6, 24 and 25, No man can serve two masters. He'll love one, he'll hate the other. You can't serve God and mammon. And this afternoon, you can probably think of other references in Scripture that round out that idea of following Christ, following His life and His instructions as a disciple, as a follower, and exactly what that means. And you can only imagine what these loyal to Christ, what these individuals, what that will mean in the tribulation. Look what it costs the Lord's disciples in Acts and in the New Testament. And you can only imagine what it will mean for these. Revelation 13, 16, and 17 says they can't buy or sell. Folks, put yourself in that. I mean, just imagine if today, I mean, right now, as we're meeting a law, someone comes in and they say, look, you can, none of you folk, unless you denounce Christ, can buy or sell anymore. Now, what would that mean for you today? I mean, really, think about that. That's these people. That's not even sanctified speculation. That's going to be reality in this day. What would that mean for you? Well, we've all just had lunch. But in a little bit, folks, it's going to be tea time. Now, how long do they say you can live without food? And they're going to go turn the water off in your house because you can't buy or sell. So how long can people live without water? Where are you going to get water? Because no one can help you for fear of their own life, so where are you going to get water? Okay, so you go down to the river and you go down somewhere and, you know, like what's in the water? I mean, there's bacteria and there's all things in there. And So what's going to happen then when you become sick? Well, it's okay. You know, as a man, I'm, you know, I tough it out. So what are you going to do when your wife gets sick? What are you going to do for her? And what are you going to do when your little children are lying in bed and crying because they've got that bug? And you can just see them deteriorating and going downhill. And there's no food to help them with strength. And there's no water. I mean, that's only food and water. Folks, just put yourself in the picture, in the shoes of these people and what that will mean for them. But in the face of that, you know what these men mean, say? 
undivided loyalty to Christ. And you know what it's going to cost them. Read what happened to Wycliffe's Lollards. You just read church history. And it's incredible what the forces of evil can do to other human beings simply because they're a Christian. It's indescribable. In chapter 14, verse 4, the Lord commends these men for a third thing. Moral purity, undivided loyalty, and what I've labeled individual consecration. The scripture says in verse 4, These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. And then thirdly, these were redeemed from among men. Okay, that's okay, but follow. These were redeemed from among men being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. These were our individuals purchased from among men, but they have this uniqueness about them. They're the first fruits unto God and the Lamb. Now, what are first fruits? Well, some of you, maybe like Brother Wally or someone else, very good gardeners. Like, I'm not, <laughs> okay? Uh, our daughter Sarah is in grade 12, and she gives it a go, and Brother Wally helps her and gives her pointers, and so we, we have a few little things growing out the back. Some of you may be expert gardeners. So what are the first fruits? Why, it's the first off the tomato plant, and it's the first little lettuce that you get, and the first couple of beans, you know, the, you, you finally, finally there, and you've got the first fruits. But they're an indication that others will follow the first, but there's going to be other fruit to follow. Now, these are said to be the first fruits. But folks, how can they be the first fruits when you and I are already saved and others in church history have already been saved? How can they be the first fruits? Well, they must be the first fruits of some other kind of unique harvest. They would have to be. They couldn't be the first fruits as we would know it. What harvest is that? Well, from Revelation 7, and I'm borrowing the thoughts of another individual now, but folks, from Revelation 7, we know that these are Jews. Okay, from those 12, they're Jewish individuals. But we also know from Romans 11, 25 to 27, there Paul writes that the nation of Israel will be converted. The totality of those people will come to Christ, their Messiah, Zechariah 12, 10. But this won't happen until the end of the tribulation when Christ comes back. So here are 144,000, and they're the first fruits of that national redemption. It's the only way I know to explain it. But what I do want to focus on, folks, and what I've drawn, trying to draw our attention to is this quality, this quality of individual consecration with an emphasis on the individuality. You see, the idea behind this is that although others of Israel could have come to Christ during the tribulation, they didn't. But these, under the harsh conditions, were willing to believe and step out and put their individual faith in Christ. And they did it all on their own. There might be somewhat of an illustration of God's thinking about this from John 20, verse 29, when the Lord talks to Thomas. You remember after the resurrection on that, the first time the Lord appeared to the disciples, Thomas wasn't there. And later Thomas said, you know what, if I don't see, I'm not going to believe. And the Lord in Revelation, or John 20, 29 finally came to Thomas and he said, Blessed are they that you know, believe without seeing. Okay, so here are people, you know, who, who you, know, you know, here's someone who just steps out by belief and faith. And here are people in the, in, in the, during the tribulation like this, these Jewish individuals who, who step out. I mean, others aren't following. But they've read the scriptures and they've heard the preaching and the witnesses have spoken and maybe they've heard the angel and they've read some of our Bible materials we were talking about the other day and so they've stepped out. And folks, the Lord is looking for men and women who will step out for him whether others do or not. You've heard of Jonathan Edwards and his 70 resolutions? Resolved. That all men should live to the glory of God. Resolved second. That whether others do or not, 
I will. The emphasis of Romans 12, 1, folks, is the individuality of the decision. And Christ needs men and women who will take an individual stand for him, whether others do or not. And the fourth thing that God commends them to in Revelation 14, verse 5, is that they are blameless in character. Their moral purity they've got and this individual character. And now in verse 5, their blameless character. Or there's in this individual consecration, now their blameless character. Notice verse 5. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the Lamb of God. Without fault. The word means blameless or above reproach. What does it mean that they were blameless and above reproach? Well, we're given an illustration of that in verse 5. In their mouth was found no guile. Why single that out? What do you think? Why are they commended for that? They're, they're without fault before the throne of God, and in their mouth was found no guile. Why single that out? Well, folks, what will be the nature of this period of the tribulation? What will be the temptation if you are a follower of Christ and if you can't buy or sell or provide for yourself without confessing the beast and worshiping him? What will be the temptation? These individuals will not stoop to falsehood. There will be no lie in their mouth, even if it means their life. But there may also be this idea included that they will accurately proclaim the Word of God without wavering or altering it. They will not compromise, even for their own life. And in perilous times, the world needs light, clear, bright, undimmed, unhidden light. And as servants of God and witnesses for the Lamb, they will be that light. And folks, Paul speaks of this very thing, a passage that ought to challenge the heart of every minister for God. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. You know the reference, but put it here now in the context for these men in this period of time. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. What's he mean by that? Not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. And look, if we handle the word of God deceitfully, our gospel is hid, and it's hid to them that are lost. Why, some of you men who are readers could stand up today and give illustrations of men you have known who have compromise the truth. And they've taken even just the Word of God and there's been a twisting of it because of the advantage that it comes to them. The prestige and the popularity and the power and the invitations to go and speak somewhere. And Ah, but we have this treasure in earthen vessels, verse 7, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. What will it mean to a man, and folks, what does it mean to a man in our day not to handle the Word of God deceitfully, but to be honest with it? You know what it means? We're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We're perplexed, we're persecuted, we're cast down, and we bear in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus. That's what it means for a man who's going to stand true to the Scriptures. He's going to be cast down, and he's going to be in places of distress, and he's going to be persecuted, and he may even bear the marks on his own body of his faithfulness to the Word of God. Folks, those people are going to face that. That's the reason I say you've got these men, and they're not able to buy or sell, and during this time they might not even be able to eat. So you know what they're going to look like after about 20 days of that? They're going to bear in their bodies the marks of the dying of the Lord Jesus. And yet, they're faithful. And folks, God singles out these qualities. Moral purity, 
undivided loyalty, individual consecration, blameless character. God singles out these qualities and commends them to us. And this is an indication that he highly values them. And he honors these men with an exclusive song. And they are because they have manifested these qualities. And they have done so in the harsh conditions of the tribulation. And that brings us to these two applications, folks. Number one, God continues to look for men with these qualities today. And even in our day, these things are rare, and yet God looks for them. Just compare these two references. 2 Timothy 3.1. You know that reference? God is looking for these qualities today in His people, particularly in His ministers. 2 Corinthians 3.1. This know also that in the last days the perilous times shall come, literally savage seasons, fierce times, for men shall be lovers of their own self, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce makers, and, and it goes on. So you know, the, verse 4, traitors, high-minded, heady, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness. That's the qualities that exist in perilous times. 2 Timothy 3.1. But folks, what does 1 Timothy 3.1 say? What's that say? Go back over there. 1 Timothy 3.1. This is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, Vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, no striker, not greed. And it goes on and on and on. Here's our perilous times that are given over to these terrible qualities. But in these times, God is looking for men who will not submit to them, but will stand out as a light, a bright beacon for others to come to. God needs people of light. Folks, people of character. And you know what he says in Matthew, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. But you know what that means to let your light shine before men? In the context, you know what that means? Well, those verses are preceded by the Beatitudes, those character qualities, mourn and be poor in spirit and be a peacemaker. In other words, it is character that enables you to let the light shine. Letting the light shine is not just going around witnessing all the time. It's character that then, of course, supports those words commending the gospel to people. Folks, God is looking for men of character. He's looking for men who will be morally pure and have an undivided loyalty and give this individual consecration. Whether other men give it or not, they're going to do it. Resolve. Live for the glory of God. Resolve whether other men do or not, I will. And they have this blameless character, and God is looking for such men. But the second application I would make is this. That these qualities are commendable in a man even when his ministry appears to be in vain. It's one thing to have those qualities when the sun is shining. But folks, it's another thing to possess those qualities and to be faithful to them when it appears your ministry is in naught. Here are these qualities, and a faithful man of God will seek to manifest them. But at times, because of difficulties in the ministry, a man can wonder if it's worth it. But even when a man's labor appears to be in vain, do you know God still commends these qualities and re will reward that faithfulness? Do you know how I know that? Do you know what the servant passages are in Isaiah? And their predictions and prophecies concerning the Messiah. Do you know what the Messiah said about his labor? 
Do you know what he said? Isaiah 49. Look what he said. Take heart, my brethren. Isaiah 49. Look what the Messiah said about his labor. But would you also note what God commended in him? Isaiah 49. Verses 1 through 5. I'm going to begin with verse 1 and comment as I go. Verses 1, folks, verse 1 gives us the Messiah's calling to the ministry. Listen, O isles, unto me, and hearken ye people from afar. The Lord hath called me from the womb, from the bowels of my mother hath he made mention of my name. There's the Messiah's calling. Verse 2, would you notice his, that he was divinely equipped for his task? And he hath made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand hath he hid me, and made me a polished shaft. In his quiver hath he hid me. In other words, I am divinely equipped for my task. And the Messiah was, right? And verse 3, the blessing of God upon his life, and said unto me, Thou art my servant, O Israel, in whom I will be glorified. Here's a passage dealing with the Messiah, the servant of Jehovah, and that he was called from his mother's womb, and that he was divinely equipped to have a mouth like a sharp sword. In other words, when he spoke, it was effective. It pierced. But look, verse 4, Then I said, I have labored in vain. I have set my strength for naught and in vain. Folks, those are the words of the Messiah. And he is stating that he labored in vain. He spent his strength for naught. It was in vain. How can such a person's ministry be in vain? Reference was made this morning. Now, folks, think about this. Reference was made this morning to Luke 4, 17 to 19, which was a quote of Isaiah 61. And the Messiah said, now think of this. The Messiah said, the Spirit of the Lord was upon him. How could your ministry be in vain when the Spirit of God was upon you? That has got to assure you of success, right? I mean, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to preach to broken hearts. Surely that means the ministry will move forward. But the Messiah said it was in vain, and he spent his strength for naught. Think. He came to his own, and they received him not. And the leaders rejected him. And Jerusalem, how oft would I have gathered thee as a mother hen gathereth her chicks, and you would not. How often, folks, think, in your own, think of your knowledge of the Gospels. How often was Christ grieved at the hardness of the people's heart? At Lazarus' tomb, we joke about the shortest verse in the Bible. At Lazarus' tomb, Jesus wept, and it wasn't because of Lazarus. He knew he was going to raise the man. You stated that passage, it was because of the hardness of people's heart as to what he had said about himself and his power and his abilities. And there is the temptation, even when we know we're called. I mean, we've known for years that God's hand was on us for ministry. And in the past, we have experienced the blessing of God and the divine equipment to minister that word. And we've seen the blessing of the Lord, and there's been some response, but now something has come. We've invested all of that time in the life of that young man, and now he's gone, and he trashed it all. And there was that family, and we got them out of the gutter, and we spent hours and hours, week after week, and the finances and the help and everything we poured into their life. And now after five years, they've given it all away. In fact, they've actually turned against us. And there is this temptation to despondency and discouragement. It's all been in vain. I've spent my strength for naught. Have you ever felt that way? I remember the night, though I didn't know what happened, 
to my dad, and he had been facing it for many years from the church family. But the night he came home after a church business meeting, and he was broken. Because that night in the business meeting, those opposed to him had stood up. And they had hired a private detective to go into my dad's past and find out a lot of rubbish. And they brought it and confronted him with it in the midst of the church. You know where they got the money to do that, to pay that detective? They took their tithe. Can you believe it? Can you believe Christian people would do that? And you think your labor may be in vain. So I want to ask you folks, what does God give to us to encourage ourselves when our labor seems to be for naught? Well, how did the Messiah encourage himself? You see, I stopped reading in the middle of the verse. Did you read on? Well, hopefully you didn't. You stayed with me. Look, verse 4. Then said I, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for naught and in vain. Yet, here it is, yet surely my judgment, my justice, my ministry is with the Lord and my work with my God. Ah, oh, my judgment. My work appears to be in vain, but you know what? It's all in God's hands. And didn't you say that when you started the ministry? I mean, you stood and told everybody, you know, I'm just going out to serve the Lord. It's all God's work anyway, you know. And now five years later or ten years later, and I know, it's easy to become discouraged. It really is. But maybe it's, maybe it's an opportunity, folks, to folk refocus on the Lord. Maybe it's become our work. And what we have to do is just go out and say, you know, I'm just going to be faithful to God and whatever happens, I mean, that's the Lord's business. I'm just the guy who sows. The Lord gives the harvest and whatever happens, that's up to Him. And if I end my life with nobody in the church, that's fine. You know of Jonathan Edwards? I was listening. I can't remember if it was when Brother Wally was in the car, but maybe it was when I went to pick him up in Ingham and we drove to the airport in Brisbane. No, we drove to Townsville and flew to Brisbane. I'm listening to a tape. And I've read this and heard this before, but you know, Jonathan Edwards labored for many, many years. And in his, during his ministry, there were two great awakenings. And... Um, but when he took the church, he took it from his grandfather, if I remember right, who had pastored that church for 60 years. And, uh, but during his grandfather's ministry, they had a practice that they would, you know, they would let people come and partake of communion, even though it appeared they weren't believers. And his grandfather, never, and Jonathan Edwards felt that that was a wrong practice, and the Lord really, can, and, and he entered the ministry and kept it up, kept it up, but over a period of time, he decided that he wasn't, you know, before the Lord, he couldn't do that. And he told his wife, he said, listen, if I confront this publicly, I'll lose my ministry. And this, here's this man, I mean, I mean, he's considered one of the greatest theologians of the time. These awakenings. And so the church business meeting came and they voted him out. And he ended up with nothing for the rest of his life. It appeared his labor was in vain. But you know what the Messiah did, folks? The Messiah encouraged himself, number one, that his ministry was the Lord's. And number two, in verse 5, notice what he says, And now saith the Lord that formed me from my womb to be a servant, to bring, me, to, to bring Jacob, Jacob again. See what his ministry was. The Lord formed him from the room, and his ministry was to bring Jacob to, again to the Lord. So he encouraged himself, folks, that his calling had not changed. From his mother's, he reminded himself from his mother's womb, he was still called to be a servant. Even though my ministry appears to be in vain, I still have the calling. My ministry is God. My calling hasn't changed. And number two, God's going to reward me. Not because I ended my life with a church of 300, but because I was faithful in my character to God. See what he says? 
though Israel be not gathered. I was brought into the world to gather Jacob to God, but though Israel be not gathered, yet shall I be glorious in the eyes of the Lord my God, and my God shall be my strength. I was brought into the world to preach and win souls to the Lord and bring them to Christ and teach and disciple them, Matthew 28. But even though people don't respond, yet I shall still be glorious in the sight of God because it's his ministry. And Paul must have encouraged himself with a passage like this because you know what he wrote about vain labor? Be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. True, labor and ministry may at times appear to have accomplished little and the time we spend and invest in someone may seem to have been lost when they fall away. But labor done, as he said, in the Lord, Paul said. Your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Labor done in the Lord, for the Lord, and by him, folks, is not vain labor. And the individual person we work with may have lost out, but God's man finds encouragement that God is pleased and will reward accordingly. Folks, God commends followers of the Lamb. And our task is simply to be faithful. Most of you here this, this afternoon would know the name R.A. Torrey. R.A. Torrey was an evangelist many years ago, travel around preaching, actually came here to Australia. And he had a song later named Hammond Tree. He called him Ham. And on one occasion, Tory was preaching a set of meetings in a particular city. And uh, the first night, nothing really seemed to happen. And Hammontree was a bit discouraged. He had been praying and seen the Lord work through Tory before on other occasions and was really discouraged. And so he couldn't find Tory, so he went back to the motel. And there was Tory sitting in the motel lobby reading the newspaper. And Hammond Tree sat down and really poured out his heart how discouraged he was and nothing happened and no one was saved. And Hammond Tree just kind of, or Tory kind of moved the newspaper aside and said, Look, Ham, the Lord to tells us just to be faithful, not fruitful. Now he says, I'm tired, let's go to bed. And the next night, Tory went and preached again the same response nothing. Nobody was saved, nothing happened. And so, you know, Hammond Tree's really down in the dumps, you know, and he went back to the motel and there's Tory sitting in the lobby reading the newspaper again. Oh, Brother Tory, you know, oh, you know, woes and nobody was saved. And look, Ham, the Lord said to be faithful, not fruitful. I'm tired, let's go to bed. And the third night. And finally, the end of the week came and the last night, I mean, things broke and I mean, there were they're just decisions made that, I mean, phenomenal. People came to the Lord and Christian people got right with the Lord. And, you know, Ham, he's all excited. You know, this is, this is really what we've been living for. And he looked for Tory, you know, boy, the Lord's really blessed. He went back to the motel and there's Tory sitting in the lobby reading his newspaper. Ah, oh, Brother Tory, you know, this is really great. Wow, the Lord really used you. Did you see the people come to the Lord and all those people saved? Tory just moved the newspaper and he said, Ham, look. The Lord tells us just to be faithful, not fruitful. Now, come on, I'm tired. Let's go to bed. And folks, God commends faithful followers. And even if your labor seems to be in vain, look, you appear with the Messiah. It's His work. And you encourage yourself with the fact that this is God's work. My calling hasn't changed. I will be glorious in the sight of the Lord if I'm faithful to the qualities that the Lord has pointed out here and just persevere for Him. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Fathers, we come this afternoon. We thank You for, as Your people, allowing us to serve You in life. And Lord, we thank You as well that You call men to labor as their vocation in the ministry of the Gospel. And Lord, in the midst of a dark hour, something like a tribulation in our own life. We pray that we might encourage ourselves with the life of the Messiah and His ministry and commit ourselves to moral purity and consecration and undivided loyalty and to being faithful 
to you, our God, and to your Son, our Savior. And we pray this this afternoon in your Son's name. Amen.